thank you all for coming. I didn't know if I'd ever get back here after the past year, year and a half, but louder. And <laughs> so I want to thank you all for coming and hopefully you can continue for the rest of the summer. Even during the pandemic, we still were doing a lot of work to the courthouse to preserve it. We redid the floor underneath it here. We're working on the outside and we have other handicap issues that we're gonna try and deal with, with wheelchair ramps and all that in the next coming years. So it's a great group of people. We put a lot of time into this to preserve this courthouse. And that's all I have to say with that. All I can say is the more you can come here, the more it helps us, it makes it worth it for us. So it's gonna be my pleasure tonight to introduce my friend, Stephanie Ellis, who, my name's Gary Ellis, we're not related, <laughs> that we know of, but um, Stephanie is the executive uh, director of Wild Care um, Cape Cod down in East Ham. She's been there for how many years, Steph? I've been there for five years. Seems long. But I've, I've been there Well, three it's your times. second trip, right. <laughs> So uh, Stephanie has a, um, a couple of degrees, a little bit unique. She has one in business uh, management from Newberry College. She has one in psychology and with a minor in animal behavior from UMass in Boston. Uh, she has an affinity for mice and birds. <laughs> which I can attest to because a couple of years ago we were out to dinner and she had to leave to go home and feed her mice. <laughs> Baby mice. I go, how do you feed mice? She goes, wouldn't I drop her? <laughs> so she worked as, also worked as the executive director of the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society in California. Uh, she was the interim executive director of the San Francisco Bay um, Bird Observatory and here on Cape Cod with the Massachusetts habitat and she's totally familiar with all the wildlife we have around here which is, as we all know, has changed over the years. Maybe she can explain it better than I can because it's definitely different than it was when I was a kid. And in her spare time, she te teaches dance and is a dance instructor for women and girls down in Harwich now, right? Yep. Right. So it'd be my pleasure to introduce her. She's a good friend of mine. I love her. Nobody has more passion for what they do than she does. And I think when you hear her talk tonight, you will see that. So. Thank you. Thank you, that was a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm super excited to be here, and um, I hope you enjoy the presentation. I was asked to talk about wildlife migrations. And so what I've done is I chose to talk about uh, osprey and eagles um, because they've made a huge comeback uh, in their populations on Cape Cod and in Massachusetts. I also wanted to talk about the eastern cottontail because they have a fascinating story. And then Atlantic puffins and snowy owls on Cape Cod. So how these animals came to be on Cape Cod. And this is a young bald eagle uh, that was in our care in 2019. I'm gonna talk about this eagle. And I first have a few slides about wild care, uh, who we are, what we do, and where we are. And so we are a 501c3, a nonprofit organization. We rely on uh, donations from the, the caring public. We take in over 1,800 animals per year. And um, that's all wildlife. Um, we don't treat domesticated animals. We don't treat pets. Um, and I have a staff of nine and over 200 volunteers. And we provide rehabilitation and veterinary care. So we have consulting veterinarians who we work with, we diagnose and we treat on site. Um, and our goal is to uh, get these wildlife uh, back out the door and back into the wild. Oops. An important part of what we do is we have 
a wildlife emergency helpline. And this helpline is um, where people like you can call us if you find an animal in distress or if you have a human wildlife conflict. Um, like baby raccoons nesting in your chimney, you know, you can call us and we'll give you tips for encouraging them to move out. And last year, you can see we received almost 12,000 phone calls to our helpline. And that's in addition to caring for the animals on site. So to me, that number alone shows the critical importance of the work that we do. And you are all very lucky. In the town of um, Barnstable, you have the Cape Wildlife Center. They do amazing work. We work with them all the time. We are separate organizations, um, but we, we collaborate on many things. And so where are we located? We are in East Ham, and we are the big yellow farmhouse that is on the Orleans Rotary. So I think I have a, a picture of that. Let me see if I can use my pointer correctly. This is the rotary heading into East Ham. This is the big yellow farmhouse, so you can wave when you're going by. And then we have various outbuildings. This is a winter view. You can see we're actually on East Ham conservation land abutting the property. Um, and we have several outbuildings on the property that are important for the work that we do. And that very large building that I just pointed out that you can see from the moon is critically important to our work because it's the largest aviary of its kind in the state of Massachusetts. And the reason it's so important is it has this elliptical shape, and there are three inner aviaries and then an outer shell. And so birds like this red-tailed hawk, they can make a continuous flight and get conditioned more true to life you know, ready for being released back into the wild. I call it the raptor treadmill. And um, because of the size of this building, we're actually able to meet the requirements for rehabilitating bald eagles, which we're going to talk about today. So super important. Another critically important part of what we do is, um, you know, being situated on Cape Cod, outer Cape, 30 miles out to sea, we get a ton of aquatic birds, lots of seabirds. And so it's an important part of their rehab process um, that we get them conditioned and waterproof and ready to be released back in the wild. So we have these two state-of-the-art seabird therapy pools. They're heated with, one of them's heated with a jacuzzi heater, which we found to be very, very efficient. And I often refer to it as the day spa for wildlife, because I think some of these ducks and puffins and things, I think they probably don't want to leave. <laughs> and so what animals do we treat at Wild Care and why? Uh, so we treat wild birds, uh, wild reptiles, amphibians, and small mammals. So the smallest mammal we can accommodate is a Virginia opossum. Um, the larger mammals, like the raccoons, coyote, otter, skunk, we refer those animals to the Birdsey Cape Wildlife Center, which is right here in Barnstable. Um, and we get animals because they're either orphaned, injured, or diseased. Um, you're going to see, and there's a theme in my talk. I chose to, to talk about animals that were once abundant, and then because of humans became less abundant. And then because of humans with conservation efforts, we've restored their populations. And I think it's really fascinating uh, conservation stories. Um, but a repeat theme that I see in my line of work is that we are impacting wildlife negatively across the board. Um, and so all of us can play a role in reducing impacts to wildlife and making a difference. Um, last year, we received 1,812 animals and representing, um, oops, my slide wasn't updated. Oh, yes, 152 different species of wildlife. So my staff have to have the knowledge um, or the networking skills to gain the knowledge to treat 152 different species. And I think my last wild care slide is this. In 2018, we received 1,857 animals, and almost 50% of those were impacted ne negatively by people. And I think it's just really important for us to recognize that that's a number, a pretty significant number for a small rehab facility um, in Massachusetts. And you can see the number one reason that we received animals in that year was cat or dog attacks, then hit by vehicles or equipment, and then nest and habitat disturbed. Um, okay, so on to the presentation. So I had to start with osprey because I feel like most people love them. They've become a Cape Cod icon, beautiful bird. 
They are incredibly abundant on Cape Cod. They are so abundant that uh, we actually are home to the largest breeding population in Massachusetts. It's estimated that we are over 500 nests at this point on Cape Cod. And I'm excited about this. Some people are not. Um, because um, one challenge that we face now is that these birds don't have any place to nest. And we'll talk about that a little more. But um, why is this so exciting, really? It's exciting because these birds are back from the brink of um, local extirpation, which is a localized extinction. What happened was, in the 1950s, um, with the spraying of DDT, which was a pesticide used to um, uh, counteract uh, malaria and um, other uh, insect-borne diseases, what happened was it caused a thinning of the eggshells for birds. And it was most notable in bald eagles and osprey. With the thinning of the eggshells, they would actually crush under the weight of the parents, and so the birds could not hatch any young. Um, so we, it, we experienced a massive decline in the eagle population in the 1950s due to this. It took all the way until 1972 for the federal government to finally realize we have a serious problem here and ban um, DDT. It's a really fascinating story. And so um, what happened was in the early 1900s, we had about 60 to 80 pair of osprey, it's believed, in Massachusetts. They reached this critical mass in the 40s with about 1,000 breeding pairs in 1940. Then there was DDT, destroyed everything. The population absolutely plummeted by 90% uh, percent in the 60s. And you can see, I put all these numbers down so that I didn't forget them. But the numbers are astounding. By 1964, because of DDT, there were only 11 pairs remaining in Massachusetts. And by 1970, only one to two pair of osprey on Cape Cod. And when I think about the 500 now, I, actually, I just get goose bumps. Um, I should say osprey bumps because they really are um, a success story. And you know, how did they rebound? Of course, populations aren't going to rebound um, just by banning DDT. So people needed to step in. So here, you know, we had done the harm with the DDT. Now we need to um, reverse those effects and do something to bring these birds back to sustainable population levels. And that's where Mass Audubon really stepped in by erecting these nest platforms, many of which you still see today. Um, they're the platforms that look like this, which provide um, osprey like a commanding view and they like a waterfront view. Um, so you find these in marsh locations, uh, ocean, bay locations, um, and since 1980, over 95% of the pairs in the state are using those artificial sites. Pretty incredible. And I just have a few more, I have um, some more information about these platforms. So in 1976, there was one pair of osprey that was known on Cape Cod, and they were nesting at the cold storage fish tower in Dennis. And this was the last of the Cape osprey that we knew. And then Mass Audubon, they started building these platforms in 1977, and at first, another pair had arrived and tried to nest in the same place, the cold storage place. And there were, you know, it's like Cape Cod's a big place, you guys, figure it out. <laughs> There's lots of places to nest. Um, initially, when osprey started to rebound on the Cape, territory was an issue. Now, because we have so many birds and not enough nesting sites, they will nest within, within view of each other, um, you know, at a nest site. It's pretty incredible. And so um, the next group of osprey nested on the radio towers on Forest Road in Chatham. And then birds started finding these nest platforms. This one has a perch. They love a perch. Again, love that, that waterfront view. Um, so the next group of osprey nested on radio towers on Forest Road in Chatham. And then they started finding the platforms, and the rest is history. We're up to 500 um, pair of osprey on Cape Cod alone. Um, however, I'm sure you've read the recent article that was published in the Cape Cod Times about um, the, the Eversource osprey dilemma. So osprey have learned that, um, you know, the double, the double um, crossbar arm that you see on most utility poles on the Cape? Osprey have learned that that is a brilliant structure to build a nest on. 
and that would be fine, except it does cause sometimes electrocution. You can see this bird's mate. Um, I apologize for the graphic image, but this just happened a few weeks ago in East Ham at Boat Meadow. Um, this bird's mate was electrocuted. It also causes nest fires. And so we work very closely with Eversource to try to be proactive. Um, they don't want to they don't want to disrupt the birds, but when safety becomes an issue, of course they have to. And so if they find a nest that has eggs in it, they do try to work around that. They do what we call rubbering up um, the lines um, to keep them insulated to prevent fires. Um, in the event that they absolutely have to move eggs or chicks, we usually get them. And then an alternate platform is set up by Eversource, and then the the eggs or the chicks are moved to that alternate platform. Um, it's really important. It's become an important part of what we do. I feel like we've become um, the osprey police. <laughs> um, and I wish I could encourage these birds to nest in better locations, but utility poles are available everywhere. And osprey, you know, historically they would nest in old old trees, and they like the tall trees. And as you know, on Cape Cod, we have a lot of stunted growth. We don't have a lot of tall trees. Um, and so we don't have a lot of remaining natural nest sites for them. So what do we do? Well, we would like to encourage more private landowners who have appropriate habitat to establish poles, um, put poles up in their backyard, uh, local land trusts um, to put up poles on suitable habitat so we can support this growing population. So threats for osprey. Uh, fishing debris is huge. Of course, these guys are referred to as fish hawks, and uh, they primarily eat fish, so they do get entangled fish, fishing hook and line injuries. And they also ingest, ingest excuse me, fish hooks. Uh, electrocution, nest fires, tornadoes, which I'll talk about next. Lead and mercury poisoning is a threat um, because these birds, um, you know, lead and mercury both bioaccumulate in invertebrates and vertebrates, so they can certainly get that from the fish that they're eating. Um, illegal nest removal, we do have people who, I don't want that osprey nesting on my chimney, <laughs> and, I, and we understand. Uh, but if there are eggs in the nest, you cannot, by law, uh, remove that nest. So that's when you would call Mass Wildlife and work with them for a solution. Illegal shooting, sadly, we do get osprey that have been shot. That is a federal offense. It's a migratory bird. And lack of nest sites we've already talked about. I just had to throw in here a couple of awesome photos. Remember the Cape Cod tornadoes in 2019? I think that was the busiest week of my life so far um, because that was right when, um, just before osprey chicks were fledging, fledging meaning ready to leave the nest. So you had all these teenager birds who were blown out of the nest and couldn't fly yet. So um, we responded to 11 nests that were down with chicks. So we were really busy. We made the Boston Globe. I worked with, I think, every fire department on Cape Cod. Um, this was Harwich. And actually, this was Bud's go-karts. You know that osprey nest right in the middle of Bud's go-karts in, um, is that considered Harwich Port? They helped us <laughs> to get those chicks back in. Um, it was a tremendous effort. We had to repair several platforms, and this is not work. This is not a normal part of Wildcare's mission, but it was critically important. I mean, we had all these babies who needed to get back into their nests, and some of them no longer had nests because they were demolished with these tornadoes. So this was Harding's Beach. Um, volunteers repaired the platform, put the chicks back, and Osprey. We have learned they will feed their chicks even if they've been gone for two weeks. We've returned chicks 14 days later with a hope and a prayer, and the parents return to care for those young. So they'll even take care of um, baby osprey that aren't theirs, and that's because they can't count. They're not the brightest birds on the planet. And so it is awesome. So we put baby osprey into other osprey's nests all the time. All the time. They're good parents. I think my last osprey slide might be this. Um, I just wanted to share, again, we do work with Eversource, and they also help us to, um, if they have to erect al alternative platforms, they help us to then get the chicks back onto those platforms. This was a baby who was displaced by a nest fire in Centerville. 
uh, I wanted to show you what they look like when they're really young, because to me, that is a living, breathing dinosaur. <laughs> Super awkward. Love them so much. Um, okay, so that was, a, that was a great conservation story. And now I want to shift to a mammal for a moment. I decided to talk about eastern cottontails because most people don't know that they are not a native species. And we are also, Cape Cod is home to the highest concentration of eastern cottontail and New England cottontail in all of Massachusetts. Um, the New England cottontail is our only native rabbit here on Cape Cod. Um, and so you, we all know these rabbits, we all love them unless you're a gardener, okay, right, because they eat everything. Um, Eastern cottontails were introduced first in 18, 1895, introduced to Nantucket and then across Massachusetts. They were imported from the lower Midwest and they were imported by Fish and Game, now Mass Wildlife, um, basically for um, stocking them for hunting. So they were brought here to be hunted and then they took over. And they love uh, dense vegetation. Also, Cape Cod has typically milder winters, you know, than off Cape, and so they were able to, able to survive. Cape Cod typically has less mammal predators um, and less domestic predators, cat and dog, than off Cape. So we are essentially a rabbit paradise, and that's why you have rabbits in your backyard eating your hostas every day with the deer. So what about the New England cottontail, and who is who? Well. God only knows, because you really can't tell them apart visually. Um, supposedly, so this is an eastern cottontail, and supposedly this is a New England cottontail, and their ears are supposed to be shorter. The eastern cottontail is supposed to have a dark rim around the outer ear, but when I look at this little bunny, I also see a dark rim. The truth is, even the experts can't tell. The only way they can distinguish them is by looking at their skulls, skulls of deceased animals. They have a specific suture to the skull that tells them apart um, from eastern cottontail. And it's interesting because in, until 1940, 1950s, when research was done, no one knew that there were two different cottontails. Okay, so we didn't know there was a native uh, New England cottontail. Um, eastern cottontails thrive in the shrub thicket habitats. If you see a rabbit that's out in the open in your yard, that is an eastern cottontail. The New England cottontail, they need successive growth. They like early growth uh, forests, really dense thickets, and they barely venture beyond that dense thicket. So the cottontail that's in the middle of your yard who doesn't care about anything, that's an eastern for sure. Really interesting. So there are differences in behaviors. Um, here is an actual New England cottontail. And oh yes, and another thing that I should have pointed out is typically they say the New England cottontail has a little black V or a little black star in the forehead. And Eastern cottontails typically have a little white star, which I'll show you. We can see that on the babies very easily. Um, so New England cottontail, they've been confirmed in several counties in Massachusetts. We work with Mass Wildlife. Um, the rabbit biologist, Dave Scarpiti, he is awesome. Um, and we, because we receive so many rabbits, we give him carcasses. You know, not all the rabbits we receive survive, unfortunately. So we give him carcasses. And this is helping them to understand where the New England cottontail is geographically located. Where can they be found on Cape Cod? So um, there's value to animals even when they're deceased. We'd prefer that they were all living um, but even the deceased have value. See this little white star on the, this baby cottontail? So beautiful, but you can't, I didn't select very good photos to show as, because you can't really see it on these animals. I love that face. Look at him, he's ready to go into someone's garden. I just know it. <laughs> so what are the threats? I just told you we have a bunny bonanza on Cape Cod. What are their threats? Um, well, for wild care, we see the adults primarily come in because they've been hit by cars. You all know, especially if you're driving at dusk or in the middle of the night, that they zigzag across the road, they're not car savvy, and they panic. 
the number one reasons we receive baby rabbits is because of nest disturbance. Dogs get into their nest, cats get into their nest. Sadly, lawnmowers and weed whackers, um, a rabbit, a cottontail rabbit, they nest in this very shallow depression in the yard. It's literally a scrape. The mother pulls some fur from her breast, lines the nest, and has the babies. And it might be right near your back door or in your dog yard. And so people don't see it, and they run it over with a lawnmower. So we always recommend if you need to mow your lawn, if you could do a quick sweep first and maybe look for a rabbit nest, um, and just make sure you're not running anyone over. Uh, pesticides, of course, these are, are vegetarians. They're eating all the uh, vegetation in your backyard, and so pesticides certainly affect them. And then natural predators, disease, loss of habitat, and kidnapping. I do have a quick slide that explains what to do if you find a cottontail rabbit nest, because most people find the nest and believe them to be orphaned. And most of the time, that is not the case, and I'm going to explain why. But I just wanted to point out New England cottontail, which is our native cottontail, they face the same threats as the eastern, um, except they also have competition with the eastern cottontails for favorable habitats. Um, because eastern cottontails are far more abundant and less um, picky when it comes to habitat. Also, I was saying that the New England cottontail, they prefer, they need continuous young forest and shrubs. And so habitat degradation and fragmentation, um, creating corridors, doesn't work for them. They're less adaptable. They also have a shorter breeding season, smaller litters, and a lower reproductive rate. So. Um, you know, I, I do hope that they can survive. Unfortunately, we don't know. I did reach out to the rabbit biologist and said, can you give me numbers? What's the population looking like for New England cottontail? And he was like, that is an impossible, <laughs> an impossible question. But they're not currently list, listed as um, endangered or threatened, um, but they're certainly vulnerable. So here's the little white star I was talking about. But notice this one doesn't have one, but he is still an eastern cottontail because of the, he has the black lined ears. But in 2020, we received 374 eastern cottontail rabbits. That is a lot of baby bunnies, mostly babies. Um, and um, many of them do survive. We have a rabbit rehabilitator who specializes in their care. Um, but many of these babies were kidnapped. And so I just want to give you a quick tip on how to prevent kidnapping of baby bunnies. If you find a rabbit nest like this in your backyard, near, near your back door, um, and you don't see the mother, that is totally normal. That's because in cottontail rabbits, they only nurse their young at dusk and dawn. Uh, well, they only nurse their young about two times in the evening. It's usually around dusk or dawn. If she were to stay at the nest, she would attract predators. Um, and so you're not going to see her at the nest. So what we tell people is if you've disturbed a nest, take some string or some hay or some grass and place it into a crisscross pattern, even an X. Place it over the nest and then check on the babies in the morning. If that has not moved, that means mom did not return. If it is moved, that means mom came back and nursed them. This works so well because those little animals, imagine they're tucked so tightly into the nest, they do not move. The only time they move is to nurse from the mom. So if she doesn't return, uh, that's not going to be disturbed. If she returns, that will be disturbed. It's sort of foolproof and it's so easy and everyone can do it. So I love to share that. So ways you can help your little backyard Friends is um, don't use pesticides, leave lots of cover for them, all, um, all the, the shrubs that they love, all the brush. Please check your brush piles before burning them. Uh, we recently got um, someone lit their brush pile up and baby rabbits fleed out of it and one of them was burned. Um, and so that little rabbit is in our care. Cats indoors, keep children and pets away from nests, and please check your nest before mowing or weed whacking. I love this photo of this little rabbit, so sweet. Um, okay, so back to the big birds and another incredible conservation story. So we had the osprey, who are, I consider the Cape Cod icons, and then we have the bald eagles, who are our national icon. 
And I am so happy to share, I'm, sur I'm sure you all saw this in the news, that uh, we have our first definitive, first confirmed eagle nest on Cape Cod this year. It's the first nest in 116 years. That is astounding. And um, we are concerned there is going to be, com we're already starting to see competition with um, eagles and osprey because we have that large osprey population and they favor similar habitat. So why is this so exciting that we have one nest? Well, this bird is back from the brink of extinction, which meaning extinct as a species, not just locally. Um, they suffered massive decline due to DDT in the 50s, just like the osprey. DDT was banned in 1972, and it took a few years for um, the federal government to declare the bald eagle as in critically endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So um, here's what happened. Again, birds, when they reach a critically low level, we have to step in to um, get those populations back to a sustainable level. They're not just going to rebound on their own. So Mass Wildlife stepped in in 1982 by introducing baby eagles from Michigan. Uh, they set up nest platforms, like the osprey platforms. They set them up in the Quabbin, which is up further north towards um, New Hampshire. And they had chicks in the nest, and they used eagle puppets to feed them. And baby birds, most baby birds, will imprint on the site that they hatched in um, and fledged from. So this is the plan. We want them to imprint at the Quabbin and come back. Um, this was a huge success. Between 1982 and the end of this eagle introduction program in 88, 41 bald eagle chicks were brought in from various locations. We needed to mix up the, the genes, the diversity. And in 1989, two pairs, the first two pairs successfully raised young, including Ross, who was the very first eagle raised at the Quabbin in 1982. So it's just astounding, and I'm so thrilled we stepped in because um, you can see here, initially in the state of Massachusetts, they were considered endangered. In 2011, that was brought down a level, eagles were considered threatened, and currently they're special concern. Um, so, and they are still protected. They're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. They're protected under the Endangered Species uh, Natural Heritage Program of Massachusetts as a special concern bird. So um, there are nest, nesting has been confirmed in several counties in Massachusetts and Cape Cod. And in 2020, we had over 70 active eagle nests. And that might not seem like a huge number, um, but considering you know, it hasn't been all that long ago since this uh, reintroduction effort has started, and now we already have eagles starting to nest on Cape Cod. It's pretty awesome. Over 71,000 nesting pairs across the United States in 2019 and removed from the Federal Endangered Species List in 2007. I'm not sure. I th this is in Massachusetts, but it is not the Cape Cod um, nest. A lot of these photos are from one of my volunteers, Carl Jacobs. Great photographer, and we can send him out on any, he loves the raptor rescues. So we just send him out to all the raptor rescues. He's an awesome guy. Um, I have to tell you a quick eagle story. Because, excuse me, in 2019, just before the tornadoes, um, we actually received two bald eagle juveniles from two separate locations. And we made the cover of the Cape Cod Times with these birds. It's awesome caring for bald eagles. One of my staff is like five feet tall, you know, and then you have this bird with massive wingspan. He was bigger than my staff. It's so cool to work with them. And so um, the first eagle was from Harwich. The bird was hanging out on beach chairs and chewing on beach towels. That is not normal bald eagle behavior. And so we sent out um, one of our staff and she was able to easily retrieve this bird. It was a young bird, extremely you know, emaciated, young, inexperienced at hunting, um, and showed some signs, not treatable levels, but detectable levels of lead in its system, in its bloodstream. And then just a couple days later, we got calls for another eagle in Truro, another young eagle about half the size Mass Wildlife believes, you know, in 
In the summer, at the end of the breeding season, young birds actually travel from Florida here. They follow the coast, they're inexperienced, they keep going, they're not finding food, and they end up in our care. So they think this was a Florida bird. The Floridian birds tend to be much smaller. But anyway, this bird was also, um, oh no, wait, I'm sorry, I mixed them up. I mixed them up because this bird was banded. Um, and so this bird was banded in the nest as a chick in Dighton by Mass Wildlife, and so we knew where it had come from. I'm sorry, so the other one was the smaller bird. Anyway, um, we had them in our care for probably a month. Oops. Lots of flight conditioning. We needed to make sure these guys are um, really conditioned and also hunting. They were pulling fish out of small kiddie pools and they were becoming aggressive, so we knew that they were ready to go. And then we worked with Mass Wildlife. They were part of the release. They banded the other bird. Um, this helps us to identify them in the future. Unfortunately, there have been no reports of either bird, and I hope that's a good sign. But these are the two birds, what they looked like in our aviary. Absolutely beautiful. And it was quite the experience. And we made the Cape Cod Times with this photo. Um, it was a remarkable day. And I feel like everyone who witnessed that will never forget. I certainly won't. And so eagles, um, back from the brink of extinction, they have a lot of threats still. And I, you know, eagles, they don't need population setbacks. The threats to them are here. Oh, actually, here's an example. Five bald eagles die of lead poisoning at Avian Haven in Freedom. This is in Maine. And what happens is bald eagles, they primarily hunt fish. However, in the winter months in the Northeast, when ice is frozen over and they can't fish, they switch to hunting um, ducks and also they will scavenge. They'll eat carcasses. And so if they ingest carcasses of deer, um, pig, et cetera, that have lead shot in them, these birds become lead poisoned. So we actually see more lead poisoning in eagles in the winter months because of this. Um, more mercury poisoning because of the bioaccumulation in, in fish that they eat in uh, the regular you know, summer months. Uh, they're also susceptible to cyanobacteria. You all know well about cyanobacterial um, outbreaks in Massachusetts. Fishing debris is a problem, um, ingestion, entanglements, and sadly, illegal shooting. Yes, there are very cruel people in this world. I like to think that the kind people um, outweigh the, the cruel people, but we do see, unfortunately, um, intentional human cruelty by the, in the act of shooting animals. It is a federal felony to shoot a bald eagle. And I skipped Probably one of the biggest ones, rodenticides. Um, rodenticides, I'm referring to the secondary anticoagulant rodenticides. These are the ones that um, we use to poison mice and rats, and it causes internal bleeding. And what happens is when you use those products, these mice go outside, they're debilitated, and they become easy prey for uh, hawks and owls, for example. And you may have all just heard there's a, there's a house docket um, that, is, that will hopefully get passed in the state of Massachusetts to put some regulations on the use of these secondary um, rodenticides, anticoagulants. And it's because we, we just had the first officially confirmed rodenticide poisoned bald eagle that did not survive. That finally woke up, you know, woke up the state. We have a problem. You're killing. Um, a national emblem. So anyway, rodenticide is a serious problem for all of our raptors. And again, you know, these aren't mouse eaters, but they are, they're scavengers. And so if they are, they'll consume rats and rodents and also opossums that have scavenged rodenticides. So they're picking this up from the environment. So my last two species that I'm going to talk about are um, not necessarily conservation stories, but I think fascinating stories because they're both fasc fascinating species. So the snowy owl and then the Atlantic puffin. And so snowy owls, I'm sure many of you have seen them on Cape Cod. They're only here in the winter months. And, um, you know, I think of them, as it's, the winter is like the arrival of the beautiful predator from the north, and we always welcome them. So they breed on Arctic tundra, and they are a, a diurnal 
owl. So they hunt by day, and it makes sense when you think about it because they breed on Arctic tundra, and so they go through periods of months of daylight hours. Um, so really, you know, the changes in daylight don't really impact them. Um, so they're what we call an eruptive species. And what I mean by that is some years we have a ton of snowy owls that come to Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and some years um, we don't have as many. And that is because it's related largely to food sources. It was always thought that if there's not enough food in the north, like if the lemming supply is low, birds were forced to come south in the winter and find food here. And that is somewhat true, except lo a local researcher, who I'll talk about, he actually found that in years where the lemmings and the other rodents are really booming, the owls have tons of babies. And so then those babies have to move south. They have to find their own territories, um, but they also have to find their own food in the winter. And so they erupt and they come south to us to hunt and then move back in the spring. It makes sense. It really does make sense. So if there's a banner crop of owls, food was good, and they're all going to be coming here uh, in the spring. It's pretty incredible. And so where can you find them? So their winter habitat here is places that resemble home, the Arctic tundra, which means barrier beaches, dunes, edges of marshes. They like to be in remote areas uh, where they can hunt small mammal prey. And hotspots are Race Point, Dennis Beach, Nosset Outer Beach, and Sandy Neck. Those are some pretty reliable places, even in a non-eruptive year, where you can find these birds. And notice here I also um, list airports. Um, snowy owls love airports. And it makes sense because they are large expanses of land, like Arctic tundra. There's no vegetation. There's always rodents, because their airports seem to often be around, um, you know, have marshes along the edges. And so it is great hunting ground for snowy owls. And so Norman Smith, he is probably the, the, the world's uh, foremost leading expert in snowy owls. He used to be the director of the Mass Audubon Blue Hills Trailside Museum. He has been doing snowy owl work since 1981, where he actually he traps these birds, um, and then he, he puts a band on them, and he puts satellite, satellite tags on them. And because of him, we know so much more about where these animals are going. Um, important information is provided by these satellite tags. We know the rate of travel, where do they stop along the way, where do they breed in winter, and also we know about poaching, sadly. I'll never forget the first time I heard Norman speak, probably 20 years ago. He said when he started this work and started putting these um, telemetry tags on these birds, you know, they would also tell him, I believe, the bird's heart rate, but also the body temperature. Um, and so, you know, he had these two birds that all of a sudden their temperature was dropping, and then there was no information. And these birds, one of them was found at, I think, Duxbury Beach, and it had been shot. Again totally illegal and enormously frustrating and disheartening to me. You know, when you think about their lifestyles, they're coming all the way from the Arctic, they're coming here um, to feed, only to be shot. Illegal, totally illegal. Um, the birds arrive early November, they leave in April, and Logan International Airport has the largest concentration of snowy owls in the Northeast. So Norman actively, he does have to relocate them, um, not all of them, but some of them when they reach this critical mass because they do pose a threat um, to air traffic that's coming in and out. They're there, they're feeding on, um, there's a rat abundance there, so it's easy, easy hunting. Um, I just want to remind you to be mindful when these birds are back again in November, Everyone wants to go out and find them, and I just want to remind you to be ethical and keep your distance, give them space. Think about they've come all this way because they need a place to rest, and they need a place to eat, and even though our weather is not as harsh as the Arctic, it's still a winter, and they have to find food. So they must conserve energy. If you can stay in your car, your car makes a great blind for viewing birds, and also buy a spotting scope. You can see things much better if you get, it's like a telescope for birding, um, and then you don't even have to get out of your car. So you can stay warm in the winter and look at the snowy owls too. 
And please be mindful of the habitat. You know, we have people just like tramping through the dunes and sensitive vegetation and spooking these owls. And it's just all just a no. Um, please don't do it. And so what are the threats to snowy owls? Sadly, a huge threat to them is rodenticide poisoning. And it also, it's disheartening for me to have to say that this beautiful bird came uh, to us. We received a call, I think it was May. Usually the birds are leave by April. Um, this bird was on, the, on a jetty in Wellfleet. Obviously we knew something was terribly wrong. If someone can catch a snowy owl and put it into a tub, you know, something's not right. Uh, sadly, this bird was end stages, rodenticide poisoning. He had severe anemia, um, bruising throughout the body, which is associated with internal hemorrhage from the rodenticides, which are an anticoagulant. We tried, we started the bird on fluids, vitamin K immediately. Vitamin K, um, it, in, it stimulates the um, red blood cells to clot. Unfortunately, it was too late, but you better believe I got on my soapbox to make this like you know, headline news the next morning for the newspapers to think about everyone wants to see these birds. And of course, we have no idea where this bird had been. I mean, it could have been poisoned, not in Massachusetts. To the degree that this bird was ill, it, it was repeat exposure likely. Um, but it could have been poisoned further north. But even so, it was a wake-up call to everyone that we need to stop using these, po these poisons. So they suffer from illegal hunting, harassment from people, starvation, climate change, of course, they're losing Arctic habitat. And also, uh, winter storms are becoming increasingly intensified, and that makes finding food more challenging. Um, also, vehicle, power line, and wind turbine collisions. And sadly, um, on the IUCN, which is the International Union Conservation uh, of Nature, they're on the red list uh, for the world as vulnerable and declining species. It's very sad. And I have just one more bird. Um, I'm ending with a really colorful one. They're such beautiful little birds. Um, so this is another beautiful winter resident to New England. Another bird that they do not breed here in the summer. You will not see them here in the summer. If you do, there's probably something wrong. We call them the parrots of the sea. And that's because, look at that beautiful bill. It's brightly colored, and that's only in the breeding season, by the way. When they're here in the winter, the bill is more dull. And the birds also take on this sooty appearance to their cheeks. They're still just, they're exquisite. They look like a painting. They are what we call an alcid. They're in the family Alcidae, which means they're related to the Murs, the Dovekeys, the Guillemonts, the Razorbills. I'm sure you've heard of all of those birds. They look like a football, a black and white football, or a penguin. When people, usually after intense winter storms, northeast storms, people call and say, there's this black and white bird in the parking lot. You know, it looks like a football. And we're like, yep. Get the bathtubs ready, because all the puffins are coming in. Um, it's so fascinating. We actually don't get them all that much. We get their relatives more, um, and I'll explain why. So they're only here in the winter. It's really difficult to see them. It's easiest to see them after a big time nor'easter, where you could go um, to places like Race Point and then look offshore and see these birds flying by, because it blows them in closer. Last year, we had an unprecedented number of puffins in the bay. That was unheard of. These birds are what we call pelagic, which means they spend their lives offshore. They only come to land to breed, and they breed. Uh, the closest to us would be um, the islands of, of the Gulf of Maine. A few of those islands are Matinicus Rock, Machia Seal Island, Eastern Egg Rock. Um, and so we don't see them here in the summer. They breed from Maine further north to Greenland. This is another conservation story um, because what happened, I know, look at this bill and look at their stance, aren't they beautiful? And you guys, they are tiny. Whenever we have puffins, reporters want to see them. And I don't know, I think they think they're like great ox that they're like this big or like king penguins or something. They literally are like, like this. It's like a little Nerf football so tiny, like a little squeak toy. And it's, they're so cute. Um, and so what happened, another conservation story, these birds 
They, um, in the 1800s, late 1800s, they were absolutely decimated in the Gulf of Maine by hunters. Hunters uh, consumed them for meat, feathers, and eggs. So they were nearly extirpated, locally extinct, from um, the Northeast. And then we, uh, National Audubon Society, stepped in in 1973. It took a while. 1973, they stepped in with the goal to restore these puffins back to the his their historic nesting islands in the Gulf of Maine. And so what they did was they took young, young puffins um, from Newfoundland and they put them, they planted them in burrows on Eastern Egg Rock Island, which is in uh, Gulf of Maine, Muscongas Bay. I've been there, I've seen the island. It's extraordinary to go out there and see all the activity and know that at one time this whole location was silenced. There was nothing there. Um, so between 1973 and 1986, almost a thousand young puffins were transplanted. And what they did was they put these puffins in burrows, these chicks, and they put fish in there every day. And the chicks didn't have human interaction. And then they fledged and they imprinted on this location. Um, like I said, most birds do. They go back to the place where they hatched. So this was ideal. Oh, and, um, and so amazingly, um, the transplanted puffins, it takes them, I want to say, five years to breed. So they'll be out at sea for five years before they return to the place where they hatched. And the way they got them to return to the place where they hatched was um, they had wooden decoys, puffin decoys, they played puffin recordings, and they had mirrors. So the birds would see all these puffins, even though they were like mirrors. It was smoke and mirrors, literally. They'd see all these puffins, these wooden puffins, and they would land, and then they would see themselves in the mirror and think there were more puffins there. It totally worked. And if you have a chance to look up this book, Project Puffin, I, ha I have had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Stephen Kress. He is the gentleman who, he came up with this for the Puffin Project and lured the birds back to the island with the decoys. He is an extraordinary man, and these methods have now been used all over the world in places where um, you're trying to establish a new seabird colony, for example, and you want to lure the birds to an island. These methods have been used. So amazingly, so the puffins started returning in 1977, and then in 1981, four pairs finally nested on the edge of the island. And today, the colony has over 150 pairs. And it's just a remarkable story. I just got goosebumps again, which I should call puffin bumps. <laughs> and I just wanted to share that we almost only get puffins after um, really intense northeast storms, sustained winds and high seas for you know 48, 72 hours. Um, last year, actually, I'm saying last year, it was this year, this winter, yes, was when we had the unprecedented number of puffins in the bay. And there was a storm. We got this little bird from Sandy Neck. He was blown in. If you ever see a puffin on the land here, something is very wrong. They do not come to shore. They only come to shore to breed, and you already know where breeding is, Maine, Maine and further north. Um, so we rehab this beautiful puffin, and we work with Project Puffin. There's a, um, a wonderful gentleman who, his name is Anthony Hill. He travels two hours to come and put bands on our puffins with the hopes that one day he will recite these individuals, he'll recite this puffin, maybe on Matinicus Island or Eastern Egg Rock, um, and it will tell him about um, their behavior. Where did this bird go to breed? He said that this bird was five years old and so would be heading back to the islands and trying to establish a territory on the islands to breed. Um, he's thrilled to work with us because still not a lot is known about their wintering distribution. We know they're here, but imagine that lifestyle. I'm in the middle of winter and they're 30 plus miles out to sea. The birds he sees are breeding adults at the nest. They're banding chicks. So he's happy to get his hot little hands on an adult who he may then recite at one of the islands. And so far we haven't had a reciting, but we, we feel 
I'll tell you what, that's going viral. If we do, I'm putting that on TikTok. <laughs> we are going viral with that. I'm be so happy. If you follow um, our YouTube page, someone came and did, a, it's like a four minute, Doc, beautiful documentary video about this puffin. He shows him be banded and then taken a race point and release and fly off and that bird did not look back. So cool. So um, threats to the Atlantic puffin, uh, climate change is a huge issue for these birds. And that is because, and I have seen it already in my almost 20 years of this work, the warming waters are causing major shifts in food availability. Then we have years where these puffins on those islands in the Gulf of Maine have total failure of chick rearing because the water is so warm that the small prey that they need to eat is for, further north. And so the parents have to leave. They're spending too long away from the nest or they're hunting nearby and feeding things like butterfish that are larger and inappropriate prey. Um, we just had a couple of years ago, sadly, it was like a total loss on some of the islands. And what researchers found were chicks were being fed butterfish and they couldn't, they couldn't eat it. I mean, they eat these chicks, I'm sorry, they eat these fish whole. And so we are seeing that, we're even seeing that on Cape Cod. It's unfortunate. Intensified winter storms, like I said, these birds, we get them when they're battered. We are seeing intensified winter storms with climate change. Uh, lead and mercury poisoning, of course, these are fish-eating birds. Again, bioaccumulation of lead and mercury in invertebrates, invertebrates. Fishing debris ingestion entanglements and an added risk that we don't have as much concern about on Cape Cod there is concern, but an oil spill in the Gulf of Maine would be absolutely devastating. Um, you know, when I just told you how hard we've worked to get 150 pair of puffins on Eastern Egg Rock and how many years that took, an oil spill would be devastating. I hope we never see that day. Okay, so I think the, this is my last, second to last slide. I hope this was interesting to everyone, and I hope that you all realize that we all can make a seriously positive difference for animals, um, even with very small actions. And we can also reverse our negative um, impacts on animals by doing the right thing. And I truly believe in our motto at WildCare is um, only through conscious efforts to reduce our large footprint can we pave the way for their smaller ones and ultimately pave the way towards a healthier planet. We, we believe that every animal matters. That's why I take care of baby orphaned white-footed mice, like Gary was saying, um, because every animal here is important, an important part of the ecosystem. I want to say thank you to Tales of Cape Cod. Um, and I'm going to switch back to that, this slide. I want to say thank you to Gary, Ellis, and Kathy for sponsoring me. And I also need to say thank you to um, Bob Prescott and Mark Faherty of Mass Audubon and Wolfley Bay for all, a lot of osprey info. Um, Jason Zimmer, he is the eagle guy for Mass Wildlife. Stephen Wright, he is um, the eagle wildlife biologist for Mass Wildlife. And then David Scarpiti is the awesome rabbit guy. And I couldn't have done this presentation without all of their, their current information. And with that, I will say thank you and I will take questions. Yes. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, this might be a dumb question, but what is an eagle puppet? An eagle puppet? Um, so it's basically, you know, a puppet that fits on the hand that looks like an eagle. I don't know what the material was made out of, but usually they'll feed, you know, with forceps or other utensils and then have this big head puppet so that the baby thinks it's being fed by an eagle. I'm sorry. It really is a puppet. I just don't know which materials they use. Probably something that could be cleaned easily. But yes, puppets. We sometimes use puppets um, with baby owls because we don't want them to imprint on us. Yeah, so it's kind of cool. Um, Google condor puppets and feeding. It's awesome. <laughs> yes. Widow. 
Yes, yeah, so the question was, if Osprey, if one of the pair die, do they find another? The answer is yes. They will, they mate for life or for as long as one lives. Um, the problem we have is, like that electrocuted male, the females typically do all the incubation, and she was still incubating, but there's no way that that nest can survive, uh, because the male would end up, while she's still incubating and then brooding the chicks, the male's responsible for bringing most of the food, so there's no way she can brood the chicks and get food for the young and feed herself. So it's a sad sight to watch. Um, and we did, we consulted with Mass Wildlife and also Eversource. Um, so it's really unfortunate when they lose a mate. And then right at this point in the season, it's really too late to re-nest because these are migratory birds and it take, it's months before, you know, it's months before they're ready to leave the nest. And so they can't nest too late in the season because then the chicks aren't ready to migrate. So that was more info than you need. But just every nest, we get calls about this because people love their osprey. And they're so visible. You know, it's like, that's my osprey pole. And there's a dead male hanging from it. What are we going to do? And we do consult with uh, Mass Wildlife. You know, I asked them if they want us to incubate those eggs in cases like that, and most often it, they want nature to take its course. But I just want you to know we do try. There's lots of osprey discussions. Any other questions? Yes. It's in East Ham, yes. We get our funding, it's largely um, pro like private donations from individuals. About 20% is grant funding. We don't receive, there's no federal, state, or municipal funding. And I used to say that events made up about 20%, well, 40% of the budget, but last year we had to do everything virtual because of the pandemic. So last year, I'm thrilled to say that people like you contributed about 71% of our, of our operating support last year. I mean, it was, it's amazing. It was a, it was a gift. We thrived during the pandemic because people were, people were very generous. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yes? Um, yes, the eastern cottontail. I don't think they're considered invasive. Oh, I've never heard them called invasive. However, they are pushing out the New England cottontail or outcompeting them, which would, I think, if we looked that up, that would be considered invasive. But good question. Everyone loves their bunnies. I love the bunnies too, but, um, but most people, I mean, they are, I didn't mention this, but they're, su they're also a critical, obviously a critical prey item for so many species. Um, Red-tailed hawks, great horned owls, that's their favorite food. Fox, coyote, um, great, they're always hit by cars and so they're getting scavenged. So they are important. I would like to see the New England cottontail rebound. Yes. Quite a dramatic leap last year. Yes. And, and I guess what I'm asking you is what do you attribute that to, and wouldn't the reduced cars on the road have actually decreased? So, what do you attribute that to? I'll let you go on that. <laughs> I'm so glad that you said that because so last year I had really thought when the pandemic hit, I thought that we would see less animals, less calls, less everything. And I was wrong. We only saw, it was a minor decrease of maybe 100 less animals. Um, and I believe it was because more people than ever were, well, looking to nature because we couldn't go anywhere. So people finally discovered birds in their backyard and were going on trails for the first time in their lives. Also, the, as you know, there's more people on Cape Cod than ever in the last year and people have stayed. So the landscaping, there were more people in the winter last year than ever before. So I simply think more humans, more humans finding things and more humans impacting things. Um, 
I feel like landscaping was being done earlier because people were here earlier if they had a second home, if that makes sense. This is totally anecdotal, I mean, it's totally anecdotal, but I was all over the news um, giving information about help us reduce the number of animals that are going to come in. Here are these tips, and I really thought that I was going, it was going to be an easier year for us in terms of animals, and it wasn't. But also, so I'm really glad we're here, <laughs> especially answering that phone um, for people who need help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes? There are, there are more eagles on the Cape, absolutely. Um, but we have seen this year the first confirmed nesting in 116 years. You may have heard last year there were um, eagles that attempted to nest near the Brewster transfer station, but that did not materialize. They, didn't, they abandoned for whatever reason. So this year, mass wildlife, and they're not disclosing the location because, of course, these are birds that are sensitive to harassment. Um, but yes, there are more eagles on Cape. You can go to Bell's Neck, Harwich, and on any given day, see eagles, um, Mill Pond, Long Pond. It's awesome. Yeah, they are here. And then in the fall, we have more juveniles who are traveling and coming from either the south or from other parts of Massachusetts. And I mean, we're surrounded by water and we have a million kettle ponds, so it's a great, another paradise for fish-eating birds. Yes. Um, yes, that's a great question. So the question is, they're nesting on all these utility poles and cell phone poles. If we don't build them, will they move back to natural habitat? Um, we hope so. I've been in a lot of discussions with Eversource and um, Mass Audubon in the Cape Wildlife Center because Eversource is slowly removing the double-armed crossbars. In the Osprey, they can't set up a platform on the single arm, and so it's like, where are all these birds going to go? And so we're hoping that they will move back to the trees. However, there's some thought that these young birds that like I've been saying through the whole presentation how birds imprint where they've hat on where they've hatched. There's controversy that some people think that these young birds, like they are going to be looking for utility poles because that's where they grew up. So we do have a problem because also we don't have the, we don't have the high tree growth here on Cape Cod. So I think we're going to really need to look at where can we put these platforms? Can more private landowners with appropriate habitat put up platforms? Um, and how do we encourage these birds to move back to natural territory when it's available? Um, right now, we're just putting a Band-Aid on things. And I wish I could brainwash all these osprey <laughs> so that they would nest in trees again. <laughs> it's a tough one. And not something that's going to happen immediately. Yes? We rarely get them. It is so sad. Supposedly, there were a few years that they say harsh winter storms had decimated them. But also, cats are a huge threat, um, outdoor cats. And, they're pop and there's been many efforts to reintroduce them. Um, and I think unusually harsh winters, vehicles and cats, there's a lot of um, man-made pressures on them. It's unfortunate, because right, I feel like this is one of the last places where you could reliably see those beautiful birds. Fort Hill is a place where you can sometimes see or hear them. I don't know if there are any further active efforts to reintroduce them at this time. Any other questions? Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.